Well, I hope you all had a very good Christmas yesterday. We had a wonderful time at the Christmas Eve uh, service, and then we had, our family had a wonderful time at Christmas as well. Um, this will be the last service we sing the Christmas songs, although I usually try to sneak in uh, joy to the world sometime in the summer, but uh, uh, other than that, uh, we'll put them all away till next year. And uh, thinking about uh, seeing new people here, it's been, it's been great to see Charlie and Anna here this time. Charlie is... Uh, of course, uh, grew up in our church here, son of the Davises, and uh, uh, had an internship here, and went off to seminary at Westminster, and now a pastor in San Diego. So we're happy to have them. As I was sitting there, I said, man, I missed the opportunity. I could have had you preach today. So we'll, we'll have to catch that another time. Maybe you didn't tell me on purpose. So anyway, I hope you had a wonderful Christmas. A few Sundays ago, we, we started a new series in the book of Matthew, and uh, at the same time, we started our Christmas series. So uh, two Sundays ago, we, uh, we looked at chapter one of Matthew and looked at Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus. And then in chapter two, Matthew skipped forward a couple of years to the event where the wise men come from the east and, and visit Jesus. And then, so this year, this, this Sunday in Matthew 3, Matthew skips forward about another 30 years uh, to the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. So that's what we'll look at today. That's found in Matthew 3, verses 1 through 12. At the coming of Jesus into the world, angels came to announce the good news to Mary and Joseph and the shepherds. And the angel said to the shepherds, unto you is born this day... In the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Well, in a similar way, now that Jesus is grown, God is going to announce the starting of his formal ministry to bring salvation to his people. But this time, angels aren't making the announcement of his arrival. Instead, God sends a prophet, the last of the Old Testament prophets, John the Baptist. So let's listen to this account from Matthew chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to see him, and they were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming, up to, his, coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So far the reading of God's word. Now this passage, at least on its surface, is about John the Baptist and his ministry. But it also really speaks to the greatness of Jesus Christ. After, the, after all, this is the account of the gospel of Jesus Christ by Matthew. And so as we look at this, we're going to have three points. The greatness of, of Jesus is seen in God sending a special herald. The greatness of Jesus is seen in the message of John. And also his greatness is seen in the need to prepare for his coming. First, the greatness of Jesus is seen in that God sends a special herald to announce his coming. 
Now, last week in the account of the wise men's visit, we saw how Jesus, even though he was born in a very, very humble situation, he is a king. And we saw that by the fact that the wise men came and worshipped him as a newborn king. Herod did all he could to destroy him because he believed him to be a king. And the Old Testament prophecies foretold of this king being born in the city of David. So since Jesus is a king, what is needed in his coming is a herald to announce his arrival. That would be what's expected in this day and culture. When a king comes, someone comes before him to announce his coming, that everybody might get ready. And since Jesus is the king of kings and lord of all, a very special herald is needed. John the Baptist fits his role. And we see this in uh, a couple of ways. First of all, we see it in his special birth. Now, it's not mentioned here in the Gospel of Matthew, but the story of John's birth is given in the Gospel of Luke. John was born six months before Jesus, which, by the way, since John was, uh, John was a cousin of Jesus, it makes John a witness uh, to the early days of Jesus' life and also to much of his ministry. It's too bad John didn't also write a book about the life of Jesus. John's birth was a miracle birth in that he was born to parents who were way past the age of being able to bear a child, and in fact, they never had a child to begin with. They couldn't have kids on their own. You might remember how an angel appeared to Zechariah, John's father, and told him that he would have a son, he would, uh, they would bear a son, who, uh, out of Luke 1, 16, who, uh, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit of pow- in the, and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So John, even before his birth, was chosen by God to be this this Old Testament prophet like that of Elijah. And that explains his uh, camel's hair coat and his leather belt and his diet of wild honey and, and locusts. He even came looking like an Old Testament prophet, like Elijah. He came as the last of the Old Testament prophets, even though we read about him in the New Testament, the last of the Old Testament prophets to prepare the way for the coming of Jesus. So from his beginnings, John is seen as a special herald to announce the coming of the king of kings. Uh, Secondly, the special character of this herald is seen in that he is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophet. Remember, I told you at the beginning of this series that Matthew really has in mind reaching out to the Jewish population. So what he does in his gospel is give us a whole bunch of Old Testament prophecies to show that Jesus is the Christ. Matthew tells us that the ministry of John as a herald announcing the coming of Jesus was foretold of in the Old Testament itself. Uh, It's in verse 3 of chapter 3 of Matthew. Uh, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord Make his path straight. Now, this is a quote from Isaiah 40, verse 3. The Gospel of Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke all mention the person and ministry of John as being foretold by the prophet Isaiah, which confirms the special person and ministry of John in announcing, introducing Jesus as the promised Savior. The Gospel of Mark gives yet another verse out of Micah 3, verse 1, which reads, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. So the coming of John as the preparer of the way for the Savior to come was no insignificant event. No, its special nature is seen in John's beginning of a special birth and also the fulfillment of prophecy. John himself, John himself understood 
the special place he had in redemptive history. He also, got a, he also got a great deal of attention with his powerful preaching and coming on the scene as an Old Testament prophet out of the wilderness. But you know, even with all of that, he, uh, he knew that the special nature of his ministry only meant to point to the greater one to come, Jesus Christ. That was his duty, to point to Jesus Christ. Maybe that's a lesson for uh, uh, celebrity preachers today that can kind of lose track of that. Well, for any preacher, we all like to be adored and liked, and the preaching's great, but we always need to remember that we're here to point to Christ. And so when all the people, verse 5, of Jerusalem and all Judea and the region around the Jordan were going out to John, what did he say? He who is coming after me is mightier than I. His sandals I am not able to or worthy to carry. The Gospel of John records John the Baptist saying to his many disciples, his many followers, I must decrease and he must increase. John, John was like the glitter of Christmas. He was like the decorations, the gifts, the parties of Christmas. He got all the attention with his camel hair clothing, organic diet of locusts and, uh, and honey, his power for preaching, and big numbers being baptized. But he was wise enough to know that the main reason for the season was not all the glitter, but the person of Jesus Christ. And so also in all the glitter and fun of Christmas and New Year's to come, don't forget the main reason for the season. But let all that you see cause you to remember Jesus, our King and Savior, has come. Come to gain salvation for you, his people. So first, we have the greatness of Jesus is seen in sending this very special, unique a herald to announce his coming. Second, we see in this event that the importance of Jesus is seen in the message itself, in the message of John. Now, if you were to boil down John's message to just a few words, I think it would be, the Lord is coming, so get ready. I think that sums it up. The Lord is coming, so get ready. The first part of the message is, the Lord is coming. So what is the ministry of God? John, it is again in verse 3, to prepare the way of the Lord. Well, if you are sent to prepare the way of the Lord, that implies he's coming soon. Uh, and also we see that in verse 10 when it says the axe is laid at the tree. I mean, it's ready to go. And also in verse 12 where it has that picture of the the winning fork is in his hand, ready to throw up the wheat and the chaff, to blow away the chaff. So the idea is that, the, that John's message is the Lord is coming, and he's coming soon to save and to judge. Now, what's interesting about this quote in Isaiah 40, verse 3, uh, in, in verse 3 of our passage, is that this is another Old Testament prophecy given by Matthew to show the, who the person of Jesus is, to show that Jesus is God. He, it is God who is coming to save his people and to judge. So the original context of Isaiah 40 pictures God himself coming for the purpose of leading his people out of the captivity of Babylon. They are to prepare the way, prepare their hearts and their minds. They're to prepare the way for God himself to come and save them. Uh, let me read, go ahead and read that. Listen to that for that in uh, Isaiah 40, 1 through 5, which uh, has become a Christmas passage as well. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground be, shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, 
and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So here, in the context of the ministry of John, comes the ultimate fulfillment of Isaiah 40. The Lord is coming, uh, and who is the Lord God? Who is John going to, announce, to introduce to the people? Jesus. Jesus is the Lord God who brings comfort, who forgives iniquity, who brings his people to the promised land and fellowship with him. That's the picture here. He is the one, John goes on to say in verse 11, that who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, that's, that's a loaded statement right there. What does he mean by the Holy Spirit and fire? Well, first of all, John might be thinking of the day of Pentecost, when after the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus pours out, baptizes, he pours out his Spirit on the church for God's greater presence and power of the Spirit, working the gifts of the Spirit in his people and building the church. Remember, it was at Pentecost, when the Spirit was poured out, that there were flames of fire on people's head. So that, that might come to mind. But along with that, and maybe more than that, while John can only baptize with water as an outward sign of a greater spiritual reality, the Holy Spirit is going to come, uh, and Jesus, rather, is going to come and do the real thing, that inner reality. He's going to baptize, that is, pour out his spirit into the hearts of his people so that they may be born again. Through the spirit, he removes our heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh, that is, a heart that is pliable to the gospel message. And I think the plan is to hear more about that from Ezekiel 36 next Sunday. So that'll be great. But what does he mean? <clears throat> what does he mean when he says that Jesus is going to baptize with fire? Well, first of all, uh, fire purifies. For example, it burns out the impurities of gold to make it pure. So while John can, uh, can only apply the waters of baptism that pictures the cleansing of sin from a person, Jesus comes to do the real thing, you see. He removes our sin. He purifies us. He forgives us our sins and continues to purify us through our life with him. But also, fire symbolizes judgment. We saw that a lot when we went through the book of Revelation. When Jesus comes again, he will bring fire to purify this world from sin. And so this becomes... Uh, not only a a statement of what Jesus will do, but a warning, a warning for those who hear his word, even today, that we need to come and repent and come to Jesus. And soon, the message is, and, and soon. Again, there are two pictures in our passage that threaten judgment coming soon. The first is verse 10, and the picture is the axe, the axe is laid to the root of every tree that does not bear good fruit, to cut it down and throw it into the fires of hell. It's not out there far away. It's laid at the root. The guy's ready to take that first swing and take it down so soon. And then in verse 12, the winnowing fork is in the hand, ready to separate the chaff from the wheat. The wheat, uh, the chaff, is those who have not obeyed the gospel and are left in their sin. They will be blown away and face the fires of hell. The wheat are those who have been made perfect through Jesus who are gathered into God's barn. But again, soonness. It's in the hand, ready to be done. The message of all the Old Testament prophets, including John the Baptist, was that at the coming of the Lord, whenever that would be, they didn't know what it was. They looked forward to it. Uh, John knew it was right there. But when, at the coming of the Lord would come both salvation and judgment. As they looked at it from their perspective from afar, it looked like these things, two things were coming together at one time. But now we know that, that uh, there was this wonderful development. When Jesus came the first time, he brought that promise of salvation 
But judgment was relayed to another time. Again, they call it prophetic perspective. One way to think about it is if you're looking at, you're traveling, and you're looking at those mountains ahead that you've got to go over, and it looks like all big one mountain range, right? But when you get close and you go up the first one, you think, oh, there's a big valley and a lot of time and effort to get to the other one. Well, the first one, that, so you, from far away, the prophet's perspective was it's all coming at the same time. So but what they found out and, uh, is that first Jesus would grant salvation, offer salvation, do the work of salvation, then later for his final judgment. That'll help you in reading the Old Testament, I think, as well. So, um, so, th- so what this means is that when Jesus came the first time, he came to bring salvation. Final judgment has been reserved for his second coming, a coming that we should have this same perspective with, that it's soon, that it's soon. That's the way the Lord wants us to think about it. So don't delay. Escape the coming judgment of God brought by Jesus by coming to him in faith. The message is the Lord is coming and coming to bring salvation and judgment. Therefore, the second part of John's message is get ready. Get ready. Prepare for his coming. So our third point is the greatness of Jesus is seen in the need to prepare for his coming. So how much, how much did you prepare for Christmas this year? Uh, I, I have this thing about putting lights on the eve, and then I have this lit deer, the three of them out in the grass. And I kind of uh, shorted myself this year. I got the lights up late, and the deer are still in my garage <laughs> in their box. So, but it'll be a nice cleanup this year anyway. But, uh, but, and how much, do you, how much do you prepare for when someone comes over to visit? Again, I didn't do too well at that either. I was telling someone else that we had our daughter and uh, son-in-law and, and their kids over, and uh, she was a good Boy Scout. She left the house cleaner than when she got it <laughs> because I didn't have it quite ready yet. That was my, that was my responsibility. But, uh, but we do prepare a lot for these things. How much did you prepare for Christmas? How much did you prepare for your visitors? How much more should we prepare for the coming of the Lord into our lives? Central to John's message was this need to prepare for the coming of the Lord. The message was, verse 3, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths, make straight paths for him. Now, what does this mean, make straight paths for him? Does it mean we're in a bulldozer and, uh, you know, cut down the nice, grade a nice little pathway, uh, some base rock, a little sand, nice fresh asphalt for a Jesus? No, of course not. Uh, the idea is we, are to, we prepare the way for the Lord by preparing our hearts and minds, and mainly to deal with our sin issues. So John's message of preparation is, verse 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, a couple of points about that message. In saying, instead of saying, the Lord is at hand. John says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, the kingdom of heaven, in short, is the reign and rule of God and his son Jesus Christ in the hearts and lives of people. Uh, that's what it is. It's mainly in this age, it's mainly spiritual, but there are physical aspects to it. Us meeting together for church pretty soon, in, uh, or at some point it's in heaven, it's going to be physical and spiritual. Uh, the fulfillment of it, but that's what it is. With the coming of Jesus comes a new development in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is coming on the scene to save people, to bring more people under his gracious rule. And how do we prepare for the coming of the Lord and his kingdom? The message of John is repent. And repentance here means making a change in heart and mind that leads to an about face in your life. A change of attitude that will be seen in the putting away of self-centeredness, where you have yourself as the king of your own kingdom, 
and putting God on the throne of your life, living for him, and again, coming more under the sovereign and gracious rule of Jesus as the king. Now, repentance is something that happens inside, right? Repentance is the unseen grace of God at work in your heart. But the fact of the matter is, true repentance always becomes evident in your life. Thus, the warning found in John's words to the Pharisees and Sadducees of his day, when he says in verse 8, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. You see, the Pharisees thought that they were uh, righteous in their legalism. The Sadducees for their rituals. And both of them thought they were good with God because of their pedigree. They were sons of Abraham, right? They say that all the time. They, Father Abraham, sons of Abraham, descendants of Abraham. But you see, we can't rely on anything in ourselves to save us, but only on the work of Jesus. It's only his perfectly righteous life lived for us. It's only his atoning death on the cross paying for our sins that uh, can lead to salvation. And this work of Jesus is received by us through repentance and faith in him. So preparing for the Lord means repentance leading away from sin and living for God. And what happened when John preached this message of repentance? Now, the culture today, we kind of, uh, kind of, generally speaking, we kind of, you know, stay away from this subject a little bit more than we should, right? Uh, and, and we, and, and the, the emphasis should be on faith, but sometimes we shy away. What happened For, in John's case? Well, by God's grace, the crowds heard him with open ears by the Spirit, and they repented of their sin, and they turned to God for their salvation. And then John baptized them. In baptism, they received, again, an outward sign, the application of water, as a pledge of God that they had been cleansed of their sin and were now ready, prepared for the Lord to come. Not in judgment but in punish or punishment, but the greater presence of God with salvation and life. John's message was, the Lord is coming. Get ready by dealing with your sin. Confess, because he is the holy God, right? And he comes in salvation and judgment. Confess, repent, turn to God, and be forgiven by the grace of God through Jesus. Of course, the message of John still applies today. As I said, in the Old Testament, uh, the Old Testament prophets, including John the Baptist, in their message uh, that the Lord was coming, they saw it as coming both in salvation, salvation as people, and judgment as well. Uh, so that's, that's why you hear John talking in these ways. Get ready. The Lord is coming. He's coming to save, but he's coming to judge. Now is the day of salvation. So, but what we know now is that when the Lord came the first time in the person of Jesus, he offered salvation. He offered salvation, but the day of final judgment was delayed until his second coming, which is still to come. So in that way, the, the message still holds today. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. So get ready. Deal with your sin. Confess, repent. Come to Christ for the forgiveness of sin, to escape the righteous and holy judgment of God yet to come. Today is still the day of salvation and life in Christ. And also, if you already have come to Christ in repentance and faith, you know, you know that repentance is not just a, a once and done task for the Christian life. Repentance is an ongoing activity on, in the Christian's life as you continue to uh, be for the Spirit to reveal your sin and, and repent, that is, turn from it, turn from those wrong attitudes, 
wrong thoughts, wrong affections, and wrong actions. Repent, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand in even a fuller way. Well, this Christmas, what better gift to give to God than a renewed commitment, a renewed commitment to give him more of your heart and that it be seen in a greater love for him and for other people and a changed life. May God give us the, all this Christmas his grace of repentance that we can turn away from sin and to him all the more. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the, your scriptures. We thank you for this account of the, the special ministry of John the Baptist as he uh, prepared the way for Jesus to come onto the scene in his formal ministry. And we pray, dear Lord, that we would hear that message today, that you would, by your grace, fill us with your spirit, that you would baptize us with your Holy Spirit and fire and purify us. Help us to understand and see our sin and in those things that, uh, uh, that, that harm us and harm the others we love and that offend you. Help us to see them and give us the grace of repentance that we might turn from them and turn to living for you each and every day. Father, help us to prepare the way for your second coming when we will see the fullness of the kingdom of heaven and experience it in glory with Jesus. Father, this all we pray in Jesus' name.